Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Bureau seminar series. So today we have Bureau speaker, Dr. Robin Dumisa. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Uh, close enough, close enough. <laughs> so Robin is a senior geomet modeling advisor at BG. He received his degree in geology from the Free University of Amsterdam and bachelor's in petroleum engineering from UT Austin. He has spent 25 years in private oil and gas industry. And for those years, he was founder and CEO of Austin oh, G, a consulting software company that he sold to a larger competitor before joining BEG. He has performed over 50 integrated uh, 3D reservoir um, characterization projects, and his research interest includes conventional and unconventional reservoirs, enhanced oil recovery, seismicity analysis, and carbon capture utilization and storage. Robin serves as an associate ed editor of, for the AAPG Bulletin, and his most recent paper, has received the President's Award for Outstanding Paper in the GCAS, GCAGS Journal. Thank you, Robin, for presenting today, Thank and the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. So this, is, um, this talk uh, is by uh, Charlie and myself. It's basically the result of the work that we've been focusing on here for the last couple of years in trying to build a, an integrated uh, geo model of uh, the Permian Basin using um, all of the uh, the knowledge that uh, Charlie has gathered from uh, from his studies, as well as all of the subsurface data I've been able to uh, to get my hands on. So, so we'll uh, we'll start off with uh, the, uh, some some high level overviews, and then dig a little bit deeper into some of the field level reservoir characterization examples. So uh, the abstract is just uh, uh, here in case we get lost. We'll skip over this one real quick. Um, this is the um, uh, requisite slide to um, that we uh, use in order to um, impress um, uh, new uh, postdocs and uh, and students on the the level of complexities associated with uh, with our workflows. It uh, it starts here. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be an integrated G G and E, which is one of those acronyms, you know, which uh, stands for uh, geology, geophysics, and engineering. It starts off with geology with uh, with all kinds of tasks, and over here it starts off with geophysics with a number of tasks, and ultimately everything seems to kind of roll over into the engineering side. But some of the things that we'll be looking at today are, are um, uh, fault detection, uh, geomodeling. We'll be looking at uh, some of the uh, velocity modeling and time depth conversion, and how we bring all that together into an integrated um, uh, geo model of the uh, Permian Basin. So uh, we learned how to do this uh, years ago when I was first hired to the Bureau in the Sloan project. Uh, uh, Scott Tinker convinced me to join the Bureau to come uh, build models of all of the uh, North America shale basins. And we did everything from there, from the Bakken to the uh, Marcellus, uh, the uh, Fort Worth Basin, the Fayetteville, the Haynesville, uh, the uh, Eaglefort, and then we started moving on to, uh, to West uh, Texas. So here's kind of where we learned how to build these, uh, these, these large models. In the Bakken, it was very, uh, very exciting. You know, lots of uh, horizontal wells that we needed to tie to the horizons. In the Barnett, we had integrated a lot of core data. In the Fayetteville, we had to focus on uh, a lot of faults and had to build uh, sealed faulted framework, same as in the Marcellus. And uh, all kinds of other uh, uh, new technologies had to be brought to bear in the Haynesville and the Eagleford in order to build these, um, these large uh, shale basin-wide uh, geomodels. And then we ended up in uh, in the Midland Basin. That's uh, the subject of the paper that uh, Priyanka was kind enough uh, to mention. And here's where we brought um, a whole bunch of the workflows related to uh, FACES um, incorporation of um, uh, petrophysical analysis uh, to bear on a uh, large uh, reservoir the size of um, uh, the Midland Basin. So what you're looking at right here is, is for instance, you know, the, the, the landing zones of, of the well right there. And if I click another button, then it'll switch over to the facies, and ultimately it shows you like the porosities. And the other pictures that you see right here show the, the landing zones over here, some of the seismic. Here is the uh, the Midland Basin over there. You know, there the, there are the faults that we've incorporated into the model. So this is a, a typical model that combines all of the available uh, interpretation data that we have in order to build a um, um, a uh, regional model. So what do we usually put in one of these models? Well, we start off with the horizontal producers, uh, regional stratigraphy, all of the core data that we can get our hands on, petrophysical well logs, faults, uh, facies, uh, production data. And we bring it all together in order to try to get a better understanding of um, what the um, 
uh, the reservoir can can tell us. So a, a little movie of that shows uh, the facies distribution for the Delaware Basin. And one of the nice things that you can do with these, these models is bring all of the legacy data to bear as well. So the older the cross section, probably the better the geology. And then we uh, load the uh, horizontal wells so you can see um, uh, those producers and uh, start showing the zones. Back in those days, we still called it the bone springs because it sounded more Texan, you know? And there are the faults in the, in the Delaware Basin, an earlier incarnation of it. And ultimately, uh, along the zonation, we sample all the petrophysical data, and then we distribute it. In this particular case, we're showing the porosity distributions uh, in the Delaware Basin. So uh, th this little example shows the uh, geo-referenced registration of the West Texas Geological Society uh, cross-sections. And those have been really helpful in guiding our interpretation across the, um, uh, the basin. And uh, some of the work that we did originally in, uh, in Tora was to build uh, the uh, regional models for the, the Wolf Camp and the Sprayberry in the Midland Basin, as well as the Wolf Camp and the Bone Spring in the Delaware Basin. And at this point, when we brought everything together into, um, in, into Petrel, and, and you know, it, it can handle it, uh, these models are uh, quite big. Each of these individual models, for instance, uh, has approximately a billion cells. So when you bring everything together, you know, it starts adding up to about two and a half billion cells. So you do need a, a fairly powerful computer and lots of memory and graphics power in order to be able to run it. But the, the, the beauty of the story is, is that it is possible. And it's actually possible with machines that aren't super expensive as compared to 10, 20 years ago. But uh, that was a bit of a challenge because as soon as we uh, finished all this work, we realized that what we really wanted to do is build a model that stretched across the central basin platform. And that is one of the most uh, challenging things in geological interpretation in the Midland Basin. So in order uh, for me to get some help on that, I uh, went back to one of my, my old mentors, uh, uh, Charlie Cairns, uh, who uh, you, many of you know as uh, one of the contributors to the Bureau for the last 30 years, an expert on uh, carbonate geology. Uh, uh, one of the best um, ways people describe him is he's the, the Guadfather because he's, he spent so much time in the Guadalupe Mountains. So um, uh, come check out that t-shirt in my office sometimes. But he's really earned that uh, moniker because he has had so many students that studied the Guadalupe Mountains and that turned all of that outcrop work into this, uh, this conceptual model-based uh, stratigraphic cross-section that is absolutely essential for anyone who is willing, who is trying to understand the complex stratigraphy of both the Delaware and the Midland Basin. So Charlie, of course, was, uh, was happy to help. And over the last couple of years, we've been working together on finding data and, and ways to research it. Uh, this is an example from uh, one of the, um, uh, the papers that he, uh, he published. Uh, that uh, we, uh, we used. This is uh, the flipped cross-section for the Delaware Basin and also a conceptual cross-section of the Midland Basin. And so we put these two together to help guide us with the actual um, uh, shelf to slope to basin correlations in both of the basins. So that meant that we need to do some, uh, some serious well lock correlations. So I, I went through all of the databases at the Bureau over the last uh, couple of years and uh, tried to find as much stratigraphic information from a large uh, number of sources. And I found approximately 360,000 wells for which uh, I was able to access some sort of stratigraphic information, such as well lock tops or descriptions of the, uh, the cores or something like that. So then um, I've been collecting tops for, for uh, uh, many years now, and uh, they come from a wide variety of sources. So we originally started off with uh, what many of us will do, some of the, uh, the published top sets from uh, IHS, for instance. Um, and very quickly, we found a lot of issues with that. So many of you who do that integrate this sort of data in your stratigraphic work will have run into the same type of thing. These are tops that are reported by operators, and very often there's inaccuracies, imprecision, mislabeling of the actual tops. So it becomes a real um, challenge to try to integrate this data into a coherent stratigraphic framework. But with uh, Charlie's help, luckily, we've been able to not only pull that together, but also compare it to some really high quality interpretations that have been performed by uh, both Charlie himself, as well as many of his students, as well as the uh, other members on the uh, uh, RCRL team. 
So we ended up with approximately two and a half million tops, uh, all of which were picked um, uh, at some point by an actual uh, human being. So, so this is um, the, the actual model I, I ended up with after uh, several years of, um, of high grading these tops and, and checking them all and, uh, and doing quality control. And what you saw right there is, I'll, I'll skip back for just a second. This is the actual um, uh, outline. We're looking at the, um, the basin from the, uh, from the south. There's a, little, uh, there's a little arrow down here, you know, that's, that points north. And we're looking at the top surface right there. And this is the actual uh, subsurface geology projected on the side. And then the next step here was um, the uh, a fence diagram. There you go. So this uh, particular model, um, uh, I'm, I'm showing it here, building it up based upon the stratigraphic horizons that we've interpreted and building it upward through time. It's not exactly equivalent time, but I'm just kind of like, you know, filling in the uh, Midland Basin first and then filling in the, uh, uh, the Delaware Basin, just to give you an idea of uh, the level of complexity of the uh, paleogeography and, and the actual uh, results from our well log correlation and, and tops integration. And here's some, uh, so, some examples. So, so this is um, uh, where we start a little bit lower down the section of the, the Simpson. And here's an example of the Cisco. And you can't quite tell it over there, but that, that's where the, the uh, Horseshoe Atoll is. And, and here's the, the, the famous San Andres. And then we end up at the top. So we've effectively built a surface to below basement uh, model because uh, as you know, uh, in our collaboration with, uh, with, with TexNet, uh, we need to be able to, uh, to relocate earthquakes uh, deep in the basement. So, But to show you that we have lots of detail in the model as well, if you zoom in on it, especially like on the Cisco, for instance, uh, in the northern part, you can see that in the northeastern part of the, um, the Horseshoe Atoll, that's where the famous fields like the, the Sacroc uh, a carbon to build up uh, shows. And that's the, the North Dome of Sacroc right there. Beyond that, we're looking towards the famous Cogdell field, which is the last uh, field where I actually uh, actively uh, drilled wells and had to sign off on AFEs. Um, the uh, field beyond that is, um, is Salt Creek, is something that uh, Charlie and I are currently uh, uh, studying within this framework of, the, um, uh, of this regional geological model. And uh, a different perspective on, for instance, let's say the, the Dean uh, horizon. So we've got the Dean uh, shown um, in the model, and you can see that this is a subcrop map. And several features immediately jump out. The Big Lake faults over here, some of the Western um, uh, faults near Pegasus. And up here, if you can see that, that's where the, the remnants of the Horseshoe Atoll are visible in the Dean horizon. So if you bring lots and lots of well locked tops together, then these types of details start uh, coming out. Now, I couldn't talk about uh, well lock correlation without mentioning uh, um, Buddy Price, who spent several years working on his uh, dissertation and uh, received his PhD from uh, uh, the University of Texas uh, Department of Geological Sciences and now works at Devon. He, he really was very proactive in bringing a lot of this data together. He was using Petra uh, and he did a lot of well lock correlations to try to get a better understanding of the shelf, the slope, the basin architecture of the um, Wolf Camp and Bone Spring formations in the Northern Delaware Basin. So some of you are familiar with these uh, famous cross sections he would put together, he would squash everything together and actually use it to interpret on similar to how we would interpret a seismic cross section. So Buddy uh, very much inspired me to continue that work and using his uh, excellent uh, interpretation, uh, we basically expanded the um, uh, well, a correlation exercise with the help of all the other um, uh, subsurface data that we have uh, to approximately 100 formation zones um, in the Permian Basin from the surface down to the basement. So, uh, what other tools do we use? Well, there's two. Uh, one of them, which I can show you a picture of, because um, uh, full disclosure, this is a piece of software that I developed uh, approximately. Uh, uh, 15 years ago, and uh, it was the basis for my, uh, my company, uh, Austin Geomodeling. And uh, this is a little video we put together for BP, one of my biggest uh, uh, customers. And what we were trying to show is a, a completely different way of doing geological interpretation, where we were actually working in three dimensions in a kind of like an integrated system. So uh, other, uh, our, our competitor basically was Petrel at the time, but Petrel didn't really have the features that, would allow you to go make well-locked top picks 
and immediately update your structural horizons as well as your thickness maps. And for a real geological interpreter, those things are your real bread and butter work. You really need to know what the thickness variations are of your zones, uh, especially in a, a shelf a region. And you need to be able to then look at it, not only in, in a 2D map view, but also in a three-dimensional perspective. So one of the advantages of this particular tool was that we could make cross sections with seismic on it that we could actually interactively date them. And we could continue to make picks on both the seismic as well as on the well log. So for instance, seeing how we move these picks and then looking at the map, you can see how as soon as a pick moves, the actual thickness map updates without you having to then go and do lots of operations and move on to the next surface and correct it. Typical workflows that many of us modelers uh, uh, are frustrated by, but uh, even more so uh, other geologists. So, so this particular tool is, is, is really useful uh, in, our, in our work to try to very, very quickly correlate thousands upon thousands of wells in a very short period of time. Now, the good news is, and I didn't quite get around to making that little video, is that our dear friends at Slumberger uh, took some inspiration and have implemented several workflows and tools over the last uh, 10 years that basically start to mimic this particular workflow. So it is now a lot more useful for doing interpretation in cross-section view as well as in the three-dimensional environment. And the combination between the two to a interpreting stratigrapher geologist is absolutely invaluable. So. Now, um, I can't talk about, well, a correlation without, um, uh, of course, you know, making sure that um, uh, we learn as much as we can from Charlie's experience in, in the outcrops. So, so what we have here is a, is a quick little segue, something that, that Charlie and I have really been focusing on here the last couple of, um, uh, the couple of um, uh, years, which is to bring in uh, as much of the outcrop data into a three-dimensional environment uh, as we can. But you can kind of see from these pictures, especially in the lower right-hand corner, for instance, what are we doing here? Well, we're actually using a virtual reality environment. So what we're doing is we're trying to bring as much of the outcrop, the digital outcrop models into a VR view where it's immediately apparent to the viewer that it's in 3D. So for a, a typical geoscientist, it becomes very easy to interpret important horizons on an actual outcrop model. And beyond that, uh, we can bring in all kinds of other data. We can bring in subsurface data, we can bring in seismic data, we can bring in core tables. Uh, so it's a really a new way to do this sort of geology without you having to necessarily go to the outcrop, although it, of course, does not replace an outcrop or a core laboratory visit in any way. It just augments it. So uh, exciting new things from, uh, from virtual reality. But for us, we, we have to use these types of tools in order to get a model built as quickly as possible. And that's why we have to make some really important decisions about the quality of our work. Right? One of the things that um, um, is very dangerous in, in 3D modeling or geological characterization is if you don't use enough data in order to be able to, uh, to formulate the, um, uh, the, the question and ultimately reach an answer. This is a simple example of where uh, a horizon in the Midland Basin was interpreted using only 10,000 tops, right? Look at the difference when you actually use three and a half times that many. You know, lots and lots of details related to the, um, the Horseshoe Atoll, the faulting, the, uh, the, the, the buildups here in the south. It's very, very important if you want to build a very accurate geological model. That is, it's not just used for a regional study, right? But can also be used to scale down to the actual field level for more detailed reservoir characterization that you start at the very beginning using as much data as you possibly can. Now, very often, people are limited. They're limited by their tools. They're limited by their time. So what's important for us to find the right tools, the right techniques, methods, right, in order to be able to accelerate that particular work. And as you saw from that uh, earlier piece of software, uh, we have built some of those tools and we can do this work much faster. Now with the help of machine learning, things are accelerated even more. So, so it's very important that we, we don't shy away from tackling very large data sets, but that we actually seek them out. And that's one of the last things that I did with my dear friend and mentor, mentor uh, Steve Rupel, who passed away in 2019. One of the last projects we did was for uh, the, the, the Suture project, it was called, for those of you that know, it was a, uh, a funded research project um, uh, for Shell. Um, Mark Schuster was um, um, uh, one of the, the sponsors on the, on the BEG side. And um, what, uh, what uh, Steve and I really uh, wanted to do is, is to correlate debrides 
and turbidites in much more higher vertical resolution, much more detail than ever before. So we use these types of tools, right? So I get to go teach Steve new ways of doing well correlation in three dimensions and so on and so forth and, and with uh, lots of more detail, but he really took to it and he correlated way more uh, tops in a particular zone than, than ever before, giving us the ability to really focus on uh, the thin bedded carbonates and the debrides uh, that we could also uh, observe in the core description. So we tried to bridge from the core description over to a high resolution well lock uh, correlation. And almost immediately, we, we got some advantages. When I normally build a, uh, a reservoir model, we do it on a, uh, a fourth order uh, cycle basis. You know, we, we get these major zones. Uh, we, we generate layers, we, we, we actually sample the actual petrophysical data, we distribute it, and so on and so forth. And in our early models in this project, uh, we, we got some decent results. But once we really put the high resolution data in there, I noticed immediately that our continuity and connectivity of the reservoir was way better uh, characterized. So we really improved the quality of our vertical sampling and were able to control the lateral distributions much better. So uh, some of the other techniques that we used for that, especially in the unconventionals, were the horizontal wells. So this is a technique that uh, I originally introduced to the Bureau back in 2016 for one of the, uh, the Haynesville fields where you, know, you have a simple um, set of uh, horizontal wells targeting one zone. We later on um, expanded it to uh, multiple zones in the, um, in the Delaware Basin. That's a subject of this uh, paper that I published in Earth Archive about a year and a half ago. For those of you who are interested to use horizontal wells to try to high grade the quality. Here's an example from the, um, um, uh, from the Fort Worth Basin. This is an example from the, the Haynesville, and this is from the Fayetteville. And um, it really helps you in, in not only identify uh, fault, faults in the subsurface, but also constrain the horizontal wells in your unconventional reservoirs a lot better. So we were noticing, for instance, that the, in certain projects that people were doing, we found errors up to 360 feet in their uh, subsurface models. The horizontal wells weren't even landing in the proper zone. So it's a, it's a good tool to, um, to use to ensure that you have the highest possible quality in your subsurface modeling. So um, one of the, the, the real nice things that we have in, uh, in our uh, Permian Basin model is access to uh, velocity data. So that was one of the, the tasks that um, uh, Alexander Cervetis, uh, who is the manager of the TechSnet group, uh, uh, put towards me and said, like, okay, can we build a Permian Basin-wide velocity model that we can use for earthquake relocation? And uh, I went looking for as much data as we could. Uh, and one of the things that I found was uh, a, a lot of these check shots, um, thanks to uh, Tom Pelletari at uh, the Velocity Data Bank in, in Houston. And uh, if you want to uh, lease one from him or license it, it's like literally $300 a pop, so you can do the math. This is not the kind of a data set that you download uh, using your credit card. This was a very generous donation because um, uh, Tom is really interested in, in doing more research on the actual velocity modeling uh, in, the, um, uh, in the Permian Basin. So uh, another source of uh, velocity data, of course, is the uh, sonic logs. And uh, what we're showing right here, looking at the Delaware Basin from the southeast side, is um, approximately... Um, uh, 6,000 um, uh, sonic logs, right? And this data that you see right here is actually donated by TGS. This is velocity data donated by XTO. And we're using that in order to uh, compare and contrast the velocities that we calculate from the sonic logs and then build our uh, variogram models for distribution away from the actual uh, seismic velocity data. So luckily with Alexander's help, we've been able to access even more uh, sonic log data for, for the future. So our, uh, our database has really been enriched here in, uh, in recent months. So the end result of all that work is, is to get a, a 3D velocity model. And here's an example of the, um, uh, here you can see that same XTO, Coyonosa volume, we're looking from the Southwest. Here's a TGS volume right there. And we built both probabilistic as well as deterministic uh, uh, velocity models that can be used for the earthquake relocation. Now, um, for all of these models, we've built uh, fully sealed faulted frameworks based upon faults that have been interpreted by uh, Lily Horn in the, the, the Scissor group and that have been uh, published. Uh, and these faults uh, and then enable us to build these individual fault blocks, which can then be used to actually analyze three-dimensional seismic velocity on a fault-by-fault -fault block basis. 
And this is a typical uh, picture, a busy picture from the southern uh, Delaware Basin. We're looking at it uh, from the top down. Right here, you see the, uh, the actual earthquake distributions from uh, the, the TexNet network. You see Lilyhorn's faults. And the picture below was um, a three-dimensional view of that. Um, we actually built a, a initial low-resolution model of the, um, the subsurface. Uh, capturing the, uh, the famous Waha structure uh, in this uh, west to east cross section over here. And then we are able to then uh, look at the actual velocity distributions derived from both our sonic as well as our uh, check shot data. But one of the problems was is that when these, these models were used to distribute this velocity data, they did not take the faults into account. So by incorporating the faults into a geocellular model and building a sealed faulted framework, we're able to then look at areas like that and effectively correct them. And that's what this picture shows. So this is the end result where we combine all of the stratigraphy for the Permian Basin model together with all of the faults built as accurate of a sealed faulted framework across the entire basin, build as accurate of a stratigraphy uh, as we can, a stratigraphic model, but then increase the resolution significantly in order to properly capture the, the various velocity regimes in, in the vertical domain, as well as its lateral change due to phase changes along the, uh, the, the layers. So once we have built that big velocity model, what is one of the immediate advantages that we have? Well, it is that when you can bring all of the seismic data that uh, we have available at the, the Bureau together into one project. So what I've done here is I've loaded all of the um, Many of you are familiar with, with the Geostar volumes. Our CRL, as well as um, uh, TextNet, have access to a lot more seismic volumes. So I've loaded all of those uh, seismic volumes, uh, numbering 35, into one Petrel project. And then what I can do, once the velocity model is built, that with a single mouse button click, I can convert all of the time seismic to depth. So now all of the seismic is integrated with my wells, my well logs, my petrophysical data, my core data, my well log tops, et cetera. So being able to switch between the two is extremely valuable to an interpreting a geoscientist because once this data, uh, this seismic data ends up in depth, we can now start to mine it for a lot of uh, information related to earthquake re relocation, uh, stratigraphic interpretation, petrophysical interpretation, et cetera. So, so this was a very important task. And this is one of the reasons why we spent so many years collecting all this data, building this model to be able to, at one point, load these models, all these, uh, uh, these um, the 3D seismic, as well as an additional 33 2D seismic lines and convert them all uh, to depth at the same time using the same model. Now, another thing I should say about that, what, what's really uh, useful is that a velocity model is never static. It never, it never just gets finished. There's always more data that becomes available. So at a certain point, when you get a big influx of new information, new check shots, new seismic velocities, new stratigraphic information, the velocity model needs to be updated in order to improve the accuracy and precision of any sort of time depth conversion or earthquake relocation. The beauty is that can be done with these types of software products. You can continually update the stratigraphy, the faults, the distributions of the velocity, and with the same one mouse button click, all of these uh, seismic volumes are automatically adjusted. So it really improves the, the accuracy and precision of our uh, uh, subsurface uh, geological interpretation. So an uh, important thing that we do with each one of these um, uh, volumes is that we uh, run it through an application that I'll talk about a little bit more later called uh, PaleoScan. Um, uh, PaleoScan is capable of doing automated fault extraction, and it's actually very good. So if you run it through PaleoScan, it gets very close to what I, as a, a subsurface seismic interpreter, would basically go and, and track myself. You know, so sometimes you know, it gets it wrong. Sometimes it gets it better than what I would do, but it's a really useful tool. Uh, Petrel, of course, also has uh, several tools. So theirs is the famous Ant Tracker automated fault extractor, and it, and it uh, was able to produce some of these results. So this is what we do with every one of those uh, depth converted to seismic volumes. We immediately put it back into, into PaleoScan, where we use the faults to constrain the actual tracking system. And for those of you not familiar with PaleoScan, I could teach a whole day's class on it because it's a, an amazing tool that really has improved 
uh, my uh, seismic interpretation productivity more than any other tool that I've encountered in the last 30 years. Um, PaleoScan is wonderful. So what we do is we, we put stuff into PaleoScan, produce faults, produce horizons, bring it right back into Petrel, integrate it with the rest of our data. So, so now we've got the velocity and now we've got uh, the, the, um, uh, the time depth conversion. What do we do with all this stuff? Well, this example shows you all of the regional and field level projects that we've undertaken, mainly in the RCRL group over the last couple of years. So we're looking at all kinds of examples from uh, uh, all based, of course, on, on Charlie's um, um, uh, geological models, right? So looking at the, the Cogdell field, Sackrock, Faskin Ranch, uh, the Johnson field. Uh, we've done uh, uh, the, the, the suture studies in, in the Delaware Basin. We focused uh, with, uh, with Buddy Price on, uh, on some of his studies um, with the carbonate buildups uh, in, the, uh, in the Wolf Camp. And we've uh, imaged uh, individual carbonate fans in the Delaware. So having all of that data uh, available within one particular model that makes it very easy to cut out a piece and zoom in on it and really focus on the detailed aspect while staying consistent with your overall regional interpretation. So that's what the real power is of bringing all this stuff together into an integrated environment. You can constantly jump between the field level detail as well as the regional understanding. And that has been one of the most valuable things to uh, an in, uh, interpreter uh, like myself to be able to truly understand what the influence of the regional geology is on the local field condition. So another uh, thing that we, uh, we use these models for, of course, is machine learning. And I'm putting this thing in mainly to, to show you that, that the stratigraphy and the faults and the distribution of the layers and therefore the distributions of the petrophysics are absolutely critical for machine learning exercise. And this is, this is an example uh, from a paper to, that we put out a couple of years ago. Uh, it's just one example of machine learning. Uh, probably a, a much more exciting one is the one that's, uh, that uh, just came out from um, um, uh, TextNet, who were, you'll see it at the next uh, image as well as in several uh, journal publications on calculating um, uh, shear wave velocities from uh, P wave velocities and other petrophysical data. And uh, Jake Lee, uh, in, uh, who works for Alexandros in, um, in the TextNet group, who collaborates with Yang Kang Cheng, who is one of our experts on machine learning, of course. As a matter of fact, he just, I don't know if you saw the, 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 the front page of the, the bureau, uh, website today, but he just won a very prestigious international award on earthquake uh, prediction, right? So he's my go-to guy for the best possible machine learning things related to the uh, prediction of particular uh, the velocity data that is absolutely critical for earthquake relocation. So bringing all these models together really improves the way in which we do machine learning, and there's countless numbers of examples to do that. It's really kind of funny because when I talk to machine learning people, you know, they, they constantly talk to me, so what do you do exactly? And I say, well, you know, we do horizons and faults and we build models and stuff. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You do machine learning labeling. So is it, what, what do you mean? Well, you're a labeler. So I have recently been upgraded from geoscientist to machine learning labeler. So that's, that's going on my CV, you know, just uh... so. Um, one of the things that we uh, do with this uh, geological model is we take all of the core data that we have available in the Bureau's uh, continuum database, and then we um, can uh, register it in three dimensions. So we know what the intervals are for each of these, uh, for each of the, uh, the, the, core, the cores. We bring that into the regional model, and we can now basically back calculate what we think the actual formation is. And this is something that uh, uh, at some point, uh, we'll, we'll do some uh, statistics on to see, uh, you know, if the formations actually change or if, uh, if there's a disagreement about that. That's not that critical. What is useful is be able to go and say, I need all of the core for a particular formation. How do I find it and where can, can we locate it? So this is kind of like an add-on functionality for our uh, continuum database. So. And uh, another important thing that we uh, need to integrate almost immediately, and this is probably has something to do with the fact that when I came to the United States, uh, since the geology department had run out of money, you know, I had no choice but to get a petroleum engineering degree. Uh, luckily, it was a fairly decent department over here. That I think, believe their rankings seem to be okay. But uh, that means that uh, anytime we talk about production data or injection data, uh, I'd like to incorporate it into the model specifically for the purpose of, uh, of validating the geological models. And so, 
So, and that, of course, uh, plays an important role in, uh, in the study of seismicity as well, showing all of these uh, uh, injection uh, intervals, um, as well as the, uh, the, the production data, reconstructing the overall uh, production and injection history over a particular region, of course, has a very important um, uh, influence our analysis of the actual uh, local induced uh, seismicity. And this is where I have to thank uh, uh, one of our former bureau uh, um, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Frank Mail, who now is, is a uh, professor at uh, Penn State University. So back to um, Buddy Price. One of the things that Buddy Price uh, was able to show is how to use high resolution vertical correlation with high density well lock uh, uh, data sets in order to start interpreting the wolf camp and the bone spring on a completely different basis. Many of you have seen his, his base maps and they, they do it justice. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I think his, his dissertation is, is required reading for anyone who studies uh, the, uh, uh, the wolf camp or the bone spring or correlation or geological interpretation in general. But what we're seeing right here is how he was able to identify these channelized features and these carbonate fans uh, where before they had been completely missed by so many other uh, geologists. And then working with him together on refining the correlation and bringing it into a three-dimensional model uh, improved on the workflow even more. So, so he, was, he was a big um, um, uh, influence on my, um, uh, uh, my interest in, in capturing these um, uh, carbonate fans. And uh, I uh, published this one a couple of years ago uh, to capture a carbonate fan in the Northern Delaware Basin where we then uh, basically sh only show the volume of the carbonate with uh, the overall thicknesses and the, the same sort of cutoffs that, um, uh, that Buddy uses uh, regularly. So. so, but Charlie and I were most interested in, in trying to figure out a way to unravel and unlock all the mysteries related to the shelf, the basin stratigraphy, you know, as you can tell from his, uh, his cross section. And we got very, very lucky because the Fasken Oil and Ranch uh, 3D seismic volume is almost recognizable from space. Because if you go onto a typical map and you post all of the wells, you will find north of Midland, a massive gaping empty hole. Hardly any wells are drilled there because it belongs to the Faskin family and they're in no hurry. What they are in a hurry of is basically sell the three-dimensional seismic volume to as many people as are willing to pay for it. And it goes for many millions of dollars. But they've been extremely kind in donating this data to Charlie Cairns, who then involved me to help interpret the actual seismic data. And we were able to come up with a new uh, shelf to basin uh, um, a stratigraphic um, uh, model that we can then translate into a, uh, uh, a faulted model. And this is, these faults were interpreted with the help of uh, Chris Sam in the RCOL group. And then we built a three-dimensional model and used that to start to distribute uh, uh, petrophysical parameters and get a much better understanding of uh, the complexity of this particular transition zone between the, uh, uh, the shelf and the basin. And an incredibly rich data set that we're still mining to this day and we go back to all the time. So this is a good place for us to kind of start transitioning from the, uh, the more regional uh, geological uh, advantages that we get from building a, uh, a Permian Basin model to the more to the more uh, field level detail. So what we're showing here is a, a typical seismic uh, cross section with some uh, acoustic impedance on it, uh, an inversion. And normally what we do is we go in with a box probe and then uh, we, uh, we filter it. And now we start to see here in the San Andres some beautiful clinoform structures. Right? And those are very important to those of us that um, uh, talk to operators who are in the business of uh, disposing of salt water in the San Andres. Right? and other formations that have these types of geological structures. So the final step is, is to, to try to quantify these clinoform structures as best as possible. Right? And that's what we can do in tools like, uh, like uh, Petrel, all the way down to individual point sets. So we can get pretty good control over it. There's only one little problem. When you do this sort of uh, complex uh, seismic interpretation, it becomes very manual, right? There's no, currently we don't have a machine learning thing until Yang Kang invents it, right? Uh, that can actually do this on the fly, right? Um, interpreting one of these uh, clinoform structures field-wide, and this is a pretty big region, would take me between one to three hours, right? And it was very useful work and valuable work, but it was 
I was projecting approximately 300 of these coniforms. So that was the better part of a year's worth of work, right? So we had to find an, a better way to, to do this sort of work. We were very, very lucky. Around this time, 2018, uh, a combination of us, uh, including Dallas Dunlap and Xavier Jansen, the, the, the principal investigator of, uh, of uh, RCRL, we heard of this French software called PaleoScan. And PaleoScan had a completely different approach to seismic interpretation. It wasn't just looking at the signals and, and it wasn't just looking at the, the pattern recognition. No, no, no. It started off with a geological model. And based upon the geological model, it started to track. And then it would refine the geological model in order to come up with the best possible auto-tracked horizons. And then on top of that, it would give you a very, very easy way to control and correct the actual tracking. So you spend a lot of time basically going in and, 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 and fixing these things in order to come up with the, be, uh, the best possible model. So um, uh, this uh, example shows um, uh, Charlie's um, uh, course that you see here sitting in the middle with one of the uh, auto-tracked uh, Uwit grainstone uh, clinoform structures in the middle of what is known as the uh, Midland Farm Unit, um, uh, traditionally uh, uh, traditionally uh, uh, produced by, uh, by Oxy, actually Oxy owns it now. So. And um, what we try to do is to try to improve our stratigraphic interpretation by incorporating the core data with the, um, uh, with the inversion results and increasing the actual layer structures. And we got the layer structures down with an average thickness of about seven feet, which starts to approach the resolution of some of the, uh, the zones, uh, the thicknesses in your core. Right? So then we took uh, Charlie's uh, core descriptions, uh, compared them to the, uh, the, the well log, started to build models that would enable us to start to distribute petrophysical parameters away from the, the core data, guided by the actual um, uh, acoustic impedance uh, signals. But of course, in order for us to do that, we needed to uh, make sure that we tracked these things. Well, how do you do that? Well. Normally, in, um, in, in geological modeling, when you try to sample this sort of seismic data, you start at the top and you uh, go and you take a top reference horizon and start to build downward, right? So what you're seeing right here is three green zones that were not created by a geological model, but they were auto-tracked by um, the uh, PaleoScan software. Now compare it to the actual typical geological thing. This is what I would do naively, right? Looking at the seismic and saying, okay, well, I want to build it parallel from the top to try to capture the geology and see what the difference is between the two uh, interpretations. You can see that the red one effectively misses a whole bunch of the local structure and stratigraphy. And you can immediately see that by when you compare the green interpretations with the red interpretations on the right-hand side and look at the overall continuity and connectivity of the various um, Uwit grainstones. So this was something that basically enabled us to then go back to the overall Fasken Ranch. So this is, we're looking at the entire Fasken uh, um, uh, seismic volume. Over here is the, um, uh, the Midland Farms unit. And we're now, if you look over here, we're looking at a horizon that is tracking upwards, right? In a crotostratigraphic manner, capturing every single one of these individual cliniform structures and effectively being able to then in Petrel show you, see the channels over here in, in the gray book right there? Show you a complete chronostratigraphic reconstruction of the infill of the Midland Basin in this part of, um, uh, of the, the field. So, so we were only able to do this because we didn't have to manually interpret each one of these 300 horizons, right? We basically, what we did is we, did, we allowed PaleoScan to do this for us. And then we can go into the details. We can look at the, an individual um, um, Uwid grainstone. Here it is. Right? So this is what it would look like extracted from the seismic with the actual acoustic impedance values. And then we can start to quantify it. This is something that, that uh, we, as, uh, we, we need to be comfortable with in our discussions with operators. They want to know not you know, what kind of rock is in the, in, in the grainstones. They want to know the, uh, the, the, in, in the internal connectivity. They want to know the overall thickness. They want to know the length. And they want to know the dimensions. They want to know the, 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 the thickness. 
uh, and then uh, the tops of where these things occur, and then um, they want to slice into them and see what the actual uh, acoustic impedance values within one of these things are, as well as the core-based uh, phase change distributions. So bringing all this stuff together uh, in, in the model gives us this sort of ability. And then what we do uh, uh, towards the end is we bring in as much of the production data uh, as we can to help validate our models. So what you're looking at right here are horizontal wells in the Wolf Camp with um, uh, estimated ultimate recoveries uh, located at the center, total fu fluids injected, water cut values. And this is basically where the engineering and the geology starts to intersect. Here is where we can set up questions about uh, related to machine learning, about dependencies of the um, uh, the actual in individual well productivity on the local geology or any other factor that we can integrate into our, our 3D models. So um, uh, the one subject I won't uh, talk about too much, but it's uh, very near and dear to my heart, it's, it's actually reservoir simulation. As a matter of fact, as a geomodeler, I really see the main reason, not so much the geological characterization, but mainly the actual validation of the production uh, forecasts. And that, of course, can be done very much so with a reservoir simulation. So if you can take a reservoir simulator, history match it, uh, for primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, uh, production, then you have some inkling, some feeling that you have validated the geological model. Right? So that's uh, uh, something that uh, uh, we've done here for the Seminole field on the, the Central Basin platform uh, and is, uh, is something that, that really benefits from, uh, uh, from the outcomes of these, uh, these regional uh, geological volumes. And of course, the next step is, and we've run out of time, so we, we can't talk about that today, uh, but uh, the, uh, it relates to the petrophysical work. So uh, maybe someday in the future, we'll show you what we've done with our petrophysical data and bring that into the model and see what the advantages are there. So, Great, some conclusions. I'll leave those uh, for you to read on your own. And acknowledgements, yeah, I can, I can go on about this one for half an hour. Uh, these are all the people that have helped me throughout my career, and I learned a lot from them, and I'm still learning from uh, from uh, many of them. And of course, I want to thank all the people uh, that have donated software and data to us uh, as well. And that effectively brings me to the end of my presentation. Wow, this is very fascinating. Oh, yeah? Let's take some questions and then... Thank you, Robin. Good, good job. Help me understand what kind of access our IA members, our research sponsors have to the models that you just wow. showed. Yes, very good question. Um, uh, in the IAs that I'm involved with, uh, which actually is, is, is RCRL, and on the other hand, we're involved with, uh, in, with TechSnet. With RCRL, one of the big advantages is, is that the, uh, the old companies donate a lot of very proprietary data. And this is the type of data that they really don't want me to show in a presentation like this. The good news is they will allow us to take the derivative data in order to inform. So once you build a model like this, it, it almost kind of becomes a bit of a magnet because one of the things I've noticed is, is that our IA sponsors very often will contact us and say, hey, can we compare our particular seismic data or our subsurface interpretation or our core data with your overall regional model to see if we're in the right ballpark, if we're in the right place. So constantly the model is being updated and refined based upon this sort of proprietary data, even though that data will never find its way into a publication or even a presentation like this. So that's one of the advantages of an IA. In the case of TextNet, things become a lot more public, right? Because they, we have to produce uh, products that can be downloaded. Let's say for instance, Lily Horn, she produces faults for the scissor they get uploaded to the Texas data repository. People can download them and use them. Uh, this particular model, um, even for TextNet, is so filled with proprietary data that we would have to make a lot of changes to it before we could actually publicly publish it. So, But in the meantime, it, it constantly being improved. We are publishing off of it. We are helping our IA sponsors. We're helping the public with it. So we believe that uh, even though we haven't uh, officially released it to the public, it still serves uh, the greater good. They don't physically get to run the model. Run yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the things is that we we do a lot of these sessions, the, uh, you know, these sessions where 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 they, they look at it. What's way more fun is the virtual reality aspect of it. Once we get a piece of this model into VR, 
And I recently did it over at, uh, at, 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 uh, at Oxy with some of their senior management. And they were really interested in, in, in as a group, looking at these models and getting a much better feeling for them because us as human beings are so used to analyzing things in 3D that we do it faster than anything else. Some people look at a screen and they have to go like, well, I, I don't get it. What am I looking at? Well, that's true because you have to move it, right? Not until you move it does it become 3D. With virtual reality glasses, everything becomes 3D immediately. So putting these types of models in that sort of space is a, is a much better way to communicate to, uh, to our sponsors. Alexander. Yes. So first of all, thank you. Excellent work. Uh, I think uh, it's amazing to see all this data together and uh, there is the products out of it. Just to add something to the question from Jay, I mean, uh, for example, the, the TextNet results of products out of this work for the part of the Delaware Basin has been already uploaded to the Texas Data Repository. So the proprietary data is not uploaded, of course, but uh, the result of the modeling and the earthquake relocation is already uploaded there. So it is it is publicly available in that case. Um, I, I think uh, my my question to you is uh, uh, when you can make another presentation like that so we can have a follow-up. I think it's amazing to see all this data together. Um, as you mentioned, the work that um, you were, did with uh, Jake uh, Lee and Yang Kang Chen mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and our, my group also in that case, uh, it's amazing. I think that this paper that is going to be out uh, soon, it's going to be... Uh, highly cited because it is important and there is a big gap in the seismic uh, right. world how to calculate the shear wave velocity out of the p wave velocity or other parameters so this this thing is really very um very important for the science we do here yeah. in the bureau and i think also for the geophysical community no that's what excites me about your your research objectives right there it's it's every old company that i talk to is interested in talking about the velocity interested in talking about the earthquake relocation but also at the same time interested in figuring out what does the subsurface geology look like because it hasn't uh, and it, it it's pertinent to their exploration production activities so. Uh, Robin, uh, thanks for a good presentation. Hey, Thank you. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, so I, I, I buy the fact that you, you want to test the validity of your results mm -hmm. uh, against uh, uh, well performance or field performance. Absolutely critical, yes. Um, but that's kind of late in the process, isn't it, to, True. to do that? Yeah, true. And uh, we all know that there are, uh, that that uh, I mean, more data should give you benefits, but uh, but uh, data are uncertain. Some are good quality, some are poor quality, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, kind of where where in the process do you do you uh, uh, account for uncertainties or qualities of of various yeah. qualities of the data? Right, that's a very good question, Jerry. It's like a, the um, when it comes to certain workflows in, in subsurface modeling, uh, for instance, uh, reserve estimates, right? Uh, the type of work that, that, that Tora does. That's where uh, probabilistic uncertainty management becomes very important. This is, very, this is a very tedious sort of task because that means that every single input parameter has to have an uncertainty associated with it, which needs to be carried throughout the entire workflow. The well lock top uncertainty, right? The calculated surface uncertainty, the fault location, the calculation of the porosity values. But the good news is the software these days has all of this built in. So it is possible. It's still a bit tedious, but when you compare it to what we used to have to do 20, 30 years ago, it is a dream. It is wonderful. So when you get to certain uh, research products that relate to uh, uh, oil, oil and gas in place calculation, being able to manage the uncertainties is, is uh, very doable. So when it comes to trying to figure out, okay, what are my, for let's say a small operator, for Star, for instance, like what, what, what am I supposed to do next? Would I recommend to them that they basically spend several years building a model? Right? No, I tell them to go, you know, download a, a copy of a CRM, right? And, uh, and, and run something like that and, and do the decline curve analysis. So uh, uh, there's, they're all fit for purpose tools. So I just want to add something on this. I mean, uncertainty certainly is important. For, uh, for example, but what we do with earthquake location, a certain is, is provided based on the um, statistics that we do out of the data. <laughs> Sorry. But the important thing, the most important thing for us is not the uncertainty because that is something you can, as I said, calculate it. But the, the bias that you might have on your earthquake relocation 
due to different parameters or attributes of your velocity model. So that is becoming the most important thing. So for example, the, the two main things for earthquake location is network geometry and earth model. So we have already published a paper and hopefully we'll get to another one that shows that those two parameters can certainly change the location and its uncertainty as a, as a follow-up that is much higher than the uncertainty you calculate and you provide through your statistical analysis um, nowadays. So even if you use like a 1D Earth model and then you provide an uncertainty, let's say, of, uh, of the hypocenter a few uh, hundred meters, then the bias can be higher than a few hundred meters if you use a more accurate Earth model. So that is the becoming the most valuable thing for what we do. So, and um, maybe as a, as a final comment, uh, you saw a very mechanistic presentation here today, right? It was about tools, it was about methodologies and techniques and data and stuff like that, right? So why even give the presentation? This is not the type of stuff that Charlie Karens and I talk about, you know, when we talk geology. You know, it's just a tool. It's like a rock ham. It's like a, an abacus, a calculator. Who cares, right? But what I've noticed over the last 30 years being involved with this sort of subsurface technology, software in general, is that it's become so good and so well integrated that if you don't use it, you are seriously hampering yourself in not being able to reach certain level of science where you can't ask certain questions. The wonderful thing is that when I work with Charlie Cairns is that he now is asking me type of questions that help me that, that require me to push the technology even further but the good thing is we're making headway we're actually moving forward and we're coming up with what i believe is better science so thank you so much for uh, attending this talk and uh, your attention uh, i appreciate it very much yes we are touching 10 so uh, we will not take any more questions as there is another conference in this room thank you everyone and thank you robin for the excellent talk and we will be meeting you next week again. Thank you. Great.